webinar today, which is sponsoring back Can the Circular Economy Help Aerospace Manufacturing? So thank you for joining the webinar today. So we will have uh, different presenters. We have myself, we have Dr. Crispin Combs, we have Dr. David Butler, we have Dr. Andreas Reimer and Dr. Grant Payne. Um, so I will just start with some housekeeping rules. So can I ask all attendees to please put their mic, uh, their mic on mute, sorry. Uh, there will be time for questions after each of the presentations. Also, you can put uh, any question that you have in the chat function at any time. So to start, uh, I would like to present uh, ENMIS. So the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland is a place where industry, academia and the public sector work together on groundbreaking manufacturing research to transform productivity levels make companies more competitive and boost the skills of current and future workforce, making Scotland and the UK a global leader in advanced manufacturing. ENMIS is also at the heart of the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District Scotland in Renfrewshire. It is operated by the University of Strathclyde and supported by gover the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Island and Island Enterprise, High Value Manufacturing Catapult, Skills Development Scotland, Scottish Funding Council, and Renfrewshire Council. So the ENMIS group is a combination of core ENMIS capability, specialist technology centers, and an active network of partners in the manufacturing communities. The team works with manufacturing businesses of all sizes from across the manufacturing and engineering sectors to increase productivities by reducing barrier to innovation, stimulate investment and increase manufacturing competitiveness, catalyze job creation and strengthen supply chain links, inspire and attract talent and equip current and the future workforce with the skills they, they and their business needs, provide leadership, build collaboration and enhance capability to influence adaptation and exploit manufacturing manufacturing <clears throat> opportunities, sorry, to boost Scotland transition to a net zero emission economy by 2045. And we are working with manufacturing businesses of all sizes and multiple sectors providing benefits across the all of Scotland. And MIS just now is uh, divided in different um, specialist centres, the Advanced Forming Research Centre and the Lightweight Manufacturing Centres, which are existing centres. and uh, next year, in August 2022, we will have a new ENMIS building, which will include the digital factory, the collaboration hub, and the manufacturing skills academy. I will now uh, I will now introduce our first speaker. So, Crispin, if you can take control of the slides, please. Thanks, Benoit. I'll just share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yes, no problem. Yeah, that's what that's all I needed. <laughs> Quick yes, and we're sorted. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar, and also thank you to uh, Nemus for uh, allowing me the opportunity to, to share our research uh, on the circular economy. Uh, my name is Crispin Coombs, as Ben was introduced. I'm head of the information management group at uh, the School of Business Economics at Loughborough University. My colleagues on this project are Dr. Alicia Parks, Professor Tom Jackson and Professor Andy West. Uh, the project has been funded by the UK Manufacturing Symbiosis Network, uh, which is very much focusing on generally industry symbiosis across different sectors, and it's hosted by Aspen University. And the task here today was to give a very sort of focused approach on how circular economy might be applied within an aerospace context. So what I'm going to talk about briefly uh, about my research today is how circular economy may be applied in aerospace, present some early findings on how the circular economy could potentially benefit your business, and how you could get involved in the research. But to get, begin with, what do we mean by the circular economy? Um, well, current business models rely on conventional linear economy, so working on a creation, consumption, and disposal of products models, the sort of example that you see on the left here. 
The problem with this model is it's not sustainable. It puts pressure on finite resources and generates significant waste and pollution. By contrast, the circular economy offers an alternative approach. It aims to ma extract maximum value from resources and keep materials in circulation for as long as possible. So it's very much focusing on a make, use, reuse, remake, and then essentially recycle. So ideally minimizing environmental impacts and also minimizing economic costs. So why does the circular economy matter for aerospace in particular? Why is that a really important area? Well, as I'm sure you're aware, UK aviation has, set, has been set a target of, of carbon zero in terms of emissions by 2050. We're certainly seeing a lot of interest globally, uh, but especially in the UK around sustainability and climate concerns. And this is really moving back up government's agendas after we sort of starting to perhaps come out of COVID or starting to move to a hopefully a slightly more positive situation on that as well. And also we've seen uh, most recently with Boris's 10 point plan, but lots of emphasis around green recovery from COVID. And so there's a recognition that obviously, and especially the aerospace sector has been hit incredibly hard because of the pandemic. But now when we come back and we restart activities and hopefully restart travel activities, it's about thinking about how we can adopt more greener manufacturing practices here. And aerospace has been already making good progress in this area. There are lots of initiatives. So the classic example of, of Rolls-Royce often cited leasing turbines and taking care of maintenance, that, that service model is what we would describe as a circular economy practice. It's not actually just making and disposing, it's actually trying to extend the life of products. EADS has achieved a 90% reduction in their aerospace grade titanium waste by using 3D printing. Uh, British Airways are investing in sustainable jet fuel uh, made from household and commercial waste. And also, of course, we're seeing great advances in terms of hydrogen and electric propulsion systems, which also offer huge potential to really drive things forward. Often these sorts of technologies really also require deep investments in industrial digital technologies. So, for example, additive manufacturing, collaborative robots, artificial intelligence, but also data analytics, virtual and augmented reality. Trouble is there are often considerable challenges to get the best out of these IDTs to really deliver the benefits that you're looking for from circular economy practices. So, for example, there might be a, a reluctance, a commercial reluctance to share data between different organizations. There's the challenge of many firms, no doubt, sort of the people on this call, you guys will may well experience this, legacy systems, uh, a lack of standards and sharing data, a lack of uh, data governance. And trying to knit that together across the whole supply chain can be quite challenging. Consequently, we've seen sort of a relatively low take up of circular economy practices so far in aerospace compared to other sectors, such as automotive. So our project is very much trying to address this point by trying to get a better understanding of why there is a lower uptake. So what are the main barriers? What are the things that might facilitate greater uptake of these industrial digital technologies for circular economy practices and trying to build that through. Our study uh, consists of three stages. Uh, first of all, uh, doing a literature review, um, focusing at what we know from existing research. So we've analysed that, we've completed that stage. Um, and getting a sense of the key messages coming through from the literature. But most of the literature is done at a broad level, a cross-sectoral level, so it's not specifically focusing on the needs of aerospace in particular. So in order to get that sensitization, uh, we were keen to get industry perspectives. So we've already conducted uh, several industry interviews uh, with an a major aerospace uh, manufacturing organization, um, and that's already helped to give us insights going through. But we also recognize that a limitation of that is that really we're only talking to one party and the aerospace industry is made up of many, many uh, different partners in the, across the supply chain and manufacturers. So this third stage, which is primarily where we are at the moment, is actually a wider survey across the whole supply chain to try and broaden our perspective across lots of different 
areas. So we get that broad feel. So the, uh, the research findings are really sensitized. So to give you an idea of some of the early findings uh, that have emerged from the study so far, uh, the focus that we are taking, and, and I suppose bear in mind I'm coming from a school of business and economics, um, is that primarily we want to start with a business focus. So our emphasis is always trying to look at business drivers on the first side. So we want to find out actually what the key business drivers are that may well be encouraging organisations to, to look to circular economy practices. And you can see four of those main areas that have emerged from the literature around sort of wanting to take advantage of new technology, concerns around business concerns, around you know, the economic pressures that aerospace sector is currently facing, environmental concerns, as one might expect, associated with the circular economy, and also government legislation and targets and expectations, as I've already been stating. Now, what we do is we work backwards from those business drivers. So instead of moving typically from left to right, you move from right to left. So our focus, if I take the top line, is if you're looking to take advantage of new technology, then an investment objective that you might set for your organization is to take advantage of AI and automation to really optimize your products and your processes. And that may well deliver certain business benefits, such as having more decentralized decisions, more autonomous systems, getting access to big data and information to allow you to look for more uh, efficient synergies, more effective decision-making in terms of how you're using products, how long you use materials for, um, and looking for new opportunities to create value um, and, and, and capture that value for the business. From a business point of view, again, you can translate it back. So if you've got clear, actually, there's a pressure on the market. The aerospace economy is, is under huge pressure at the moment because of, of COVID-19. So I recognize that many organizations are really looking at ways to say, how can we cut costs? How can we improve our global competitiveness and potentially changing how you sell products? Is it more as a, as a service offering rather than simply as a product to be sold? Now that works for some organizations and not for others, but I think as a mindset change that also can deliver sort of real benefits. And you can see, I'm not going to talk through all of these, but these again can see other examples. So lower resource costs that might deliver a business benefit. You might get improved efficiency and performance of assets from manufacturing processes, getting better value out of what you deliver using sort of less resource there. Perhaps being able to provide a more customized product to, um, to your customers. But also, and I think this is really interesting, and one of the things that struck me when we've been doing this research, is this is not an either-or model. So now then there's environmental concerns, so you can have your hitting uh, targets around investment objectives, such as resource scarcity and trying to increase sustainability, reducing pollution. But the really great thing about the circular economy is that this is not, we will focus just on environmental outputs. Circular economy practices can help you hit those business concerns and take advantage of new technology as well. So it isn't, okay, we're just focusing on green agendas here. We're actually focusing on core business agendas, I would say, but also trying to adapt it from a green point of view, if you like, a more sustainable way of act, uh, acting. These approaches may well allow you then to extend your product's longevity, recirculate your product and material streams so you're actually really looking for how you can actually get more value out of those materials that you use first time around and maintaining the the lifespan uh, of some of the products you're using along the way obviously the last point there in terms of the main driver around government legislation obviously a lot of pressure around reducing co2 emissions and other uh, emissions generally from aerospace. So again, one of the business benefits might be is actually showcasing your business as an organization that is really embracing this, this green and more environmental agenda, which at the end of the day, aerospace, unfortunately, often is presented as one of the difficult, um, one of the challenging sectors in terms of um, uh, pollution. So to give you an idea of what we're looking to try and work towards, and this is an example of a partial benefits map that we've produced so far. And there's a lot of information on the slide. I appreciate that. You get a sense of the network view that we're trying to build. But first of all, I'd like you just to look at the bottom. And you can see we've got six sort of categories there. And that's how we 
try and link this together, working from IT enablers, facilitators, the business changes that your organization might need to take advantage of these uh, new technologies, some of the inhibitors and barriers going through the potential business benefits and investment objectives that I've already mentioned. When developing this sort of model, from our point of view, we work again from right to left. So we start very much with investment objectives and business benefits, and then working back to the IT enablers. That way it focuses on a business-led analysis of the situation and how the circular economy might help an organization rather than a technology-led approach. From an organizational point of view, if you then want to actually implement some of these practices, having done this mapping exercise, then you can work from left to right and you get that pathway uh, and roadmap if like going through. So how can you help? How can you sort of uh, move us on and take us forward? What we have so far is a lot of insights uh, from the literature and interviews from one aerospace manufacturer. But what we really need is a wider perspective. We've identified a range of enablers and inhibitors to business benefits, investment objectives and drivers. But we want to know, actually, this is a range. Which ones do you think are most important? Which ones, sorry, moving on a bit fast, which ones really make a difference uh, from your perspective? Which ones do you consider most important for your business? And have we got everything? Are there any factors that you think actually should be included that we don't have already and that we know, might need to include? So that's where we would really like your help. And one of the activities during the break today, you'll see sort of the diagram uh, the picture on the left here, bouncing back the title of the webinar, we would be enormously grateful if you could spend a few minutes filling in a survey. Uh, it, it's completely confidential. Your data is not going to be shared uh, beyond sort of the project going through. Uh, just to give your thoughts and perspectives. Why we think this would be useful for you? Um, well, just, I mean, it's a survey. At the end of the day, you get a sense of what's going through. But by going through the survey, it will give you an idea of what the literature has already told us around what the potential challenges are around adopting circular economy practices, potential facilitators that might be useful to you, and some of the benefits of leveraging it, uh, the circular economy in the aerospace sector. For everyone who participates in the survey, in the survey, we will be providing a summary report of the key findings, and that report will highlight the priorities for aerospace and give some ideas around uh, redesigning business models in a post-pandemic world. So thinking about how that might be approached, and we will be providing sort of a benefits uh, map um, to give uh, that overview of what's going through. Uh, the access to the UK uh, manufacturing symbiosis network will also be available to you. Um, and there are other studies beyond our own, which is obviously focused on the aerospace sector in circular economy projects such as plastics and construction and even fashion, which may be useful for getting a sense of actually how other industries are approaching this challenge and what other opportunities there might be. Also, participants will be invited if they wish to, if they wish to include their, their contact details to future dissemination events and going through. You can find more information about uh, this project uh, and um, the other projects at the web address there, which is the UK Manufacturing Symbiosis Network. Um, hosted by Aston University. And obviously, if you've got any direct contact queries or anything, my email address is there and I'd be very happy to answer those. So that uh, brings my show to a close and I would be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Crispin. Um, so I've had no questions in the main chat bar, but I've had two questions sent through to me privately. Um, so the first one is, what were the main digital technologies that have been highlighted by your research for circular economies? So it's interesting. So far, I mean, there was a huge range of digital technologies that potentially could be flagged. I, mean, I mentioned some of them on that first slide going through. And we were expecting to hear a lot around AI because there's a lot of hype around that and new technologies. But the things that are coming through so far actually are two. One, there was a real emphasis on cybersecurity. So there was a recognition that actually organizations needed to make sure that their systems were secure and safe to allow the opportunity for organizations to have confidence in sharing data 
between different partners. So if you are going to share data across with another organization to try and create a network and, and start the circular economy connections growing, you need to be confident both in the other company and their security, but also in your own. But also the need to develop sort of digital sharing platforms to share data um, so that different organizations can actually use this data and participate in such a way. So there needs to be mechanisms by which you can organize that. So again, back to cybersecurity is making sure your data is secure as well. There were other things around data analytics, which you might expect, but um, yeah, those were two highlights that came through, uh, which we weren't necessarily expecting. And actually it would be really interesting um, as, as more people complete the survey to, to get a sense of whether those are still the priority areas or whether there's anything else that's important as well. Okay, that's, that's interesting. That actually leads on quite nicely to the next question. and. Uh, someone has asked, do you think the pandemic will accelerate the uptake of circular economy principles? I would like to think so. I think what we've seen is that there are two trends in terms of actually, I think the pandemic has really made us, forced us to stop. Um, obviously, it stopped aerospace and, it, and it's allowed a lot of organisations to sit back and say, OK, we need to reset. There's been a lot of an initial sort of firefighting, but if you're able to exist and, and to come forward through this, um, then I think then this is the opportunity to sort of say, okay, if we're going to invest this time around, we've got to do it in a greener way and a more sustainable way, just because there are business benefits um, that you would have wanted prior to this outside of the circular economy, you would want these sorts of business benefits around increased productivity, increasing product lifespan and so on. And this is just an opportunity to essentially achieve both at the same time, the sort of, so making for a, for a better outcome, for the, if you like, for, for the world, a better outcome for the industry, but also a better outcome for each organisation as well. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it is a, a highly unique situation, or let's hope it's a very highly unique situation um, that has allowed us to actually reconsider some of what we're doing and really um, have the opportunity to to just hit the reset button almost. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll discuss more about the survey at the break, but now we're going to move on to Dr. David Butler, who has a presentation for you now. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Crispin. And thanks, Grant. Let's get this one up. Too many slides, the usual problem, too many screens open. Right. I guess you can see my slides. Hopefully you can. Um, right. So my name is David Butler. I'm from the University of Strathclyde and NMIS. Um, topic is aircraft decommissioning. And the picture you're looking at was actually taken at Manchester Airport. Now, this is something you would not normally see if you were flying, but because of the global pandemic, they were allowed this company was allowed to start dismantling or disassembling aircraft at the airport. As a passenger, you wouldn't like to look out the window and see aircraft decommissioning going on. So aircraft decommissioning is an activity which has been gaining a lot of attention during the pandemic. And this work I'm presenting has been funded partly by the Scottish government through ADS, looking at the Aerospace Resilience Group. How do we, as particularly in Scotland, help bring the aviation industry back up to where it was before. Can we look at new alternatives and of, of revenue and uh, even new businesses completely? At the same time, we also have um, at Sense one of the networks similar to what CRISPN was supported by. This is the Circular Economy and Network Transportation Systems have also supported the work along with the Scottish Institute of Remanufacture. So the topic of decommissioning has got a lot of attention because we've seen pictures on in a newspaper as the ones on the right hand side. Aircrafts lined up in, well, in, in this case, in almost in a desert uh, because it's nice and dry. And the stories about so many aircraft would never come back into service. Even planes like the 747s and the A380s have been taken out. Now, a lot were taken out as a reaction due to the sudden downturn in the amount of travel. But a lot of these older and larger aircraft are now being prematurely retired. And we estimate up to about 7,000 aircraft may not go back into service. Now that's a lot of locked in assets, a lot of valuable components. Nothing's being done about it. A lot of them are just sitting there. And on a good year, it typically 750 to 900 aircraft get taken out of service. We're seeing forward going for the next 10 years up to about 1500 aircraft a year being just retired. 
and retire means into long-term storage or certain parts will be taken out. But to decommission, to take it apart into its constituent uh, components and either put back into service those parts or and recycle or reuse the rest, only up to 300 to 450 aircraft a year go for that. So there's a massive gap in the, in the amount of capabilities we have globally. And we started looking at the aircraft decommissioning industry because we figured we could do something in Scotland. And the UK has activities in decommissioning, but it's an op it's there's a gap there. There's obviously supply is greater than demand. Is an opportunity to do something about establishing a decommissioning capability north of the border. And I put this down just to show you the kind of stakeholders you have to deal with, from the airframe manufacturers, your likes of Embraer, Boeing, and Airbus to the equipment component manufacturers, such as uh, Rayfon, um, the leasing companies, which are one of those unknown entities. Most aircraft are not owned by airlines. They're owned by leasing companies who negotiate uh, long-term or even something called stub leasing. There's quite a few variations they can do uh, when it comes to getting the aircraft out. And they have been suffering quite a lot during this pandemic. As asset managers who want to strip off the aircraft parts, the actual decommissioning activity, recyclers, the airports, and there's been some attempt to try to come up with best practices. So Crispin talked about a circular economy. Uh, I've been attending presentations with the wind turbine industry, which turns around and says the aerospace sector for decommissioning is the benchmark. The more you understand about the aerospace sector, the less you believe that's the case. A lot of the processes are still involving landfill. So just a bit about economics. Um, most of the money of an aircraft when it comes in for, re, for, for decommissioning is the engines. That's about 85% of the value along with the landing gear and the engines. The rest, the fuselage, the interior, these are the most undesirable parts. And that's usually just shredded, separated and burnt, whatever they can, and the rest is landfilled. So as an industry, it may seem glamorous to fly. The decommissioning side, not so glamorous. And this is one of the challenges we have. And I put down here some of the typical values of some of the parts we take off the aircraft. Now, that's the easy things. The hard things to recycle are things like the in-flight entertainment system. What do you do with all these screens? Do you have to break them down, take out the mercury and other elements? Also, the floorboard and a lot of material is made out of something called Nomex, which is not easy to recycle. The interior walls are the same. And one of the biggest problems is the seats. Nobody wants the seats. So you imagine each aircraft coming in, you've got 300 seats to get rid of. And it's a very complex assembly. It involves composites, fire retardant, polymers, uh, aluminium. There's probably around 50 different components in the seat. And what seems like a very simple part of an aircraft is one of the challenges when you're coming towards a circular economy. What do you do with 300 seats and times it by um, 1,000 aircraft a year? As part of research, we looked into the waste streams and we analysed one of the companies which actually reported to the UK government on what the waste went to. And you can see, looking at the charts and the table on the right hand side, a lot of it ends up in landfill or is incinerated. Recovery is the metal, metals, particularly your alloys. Um, it's still the most efficient way of doing it. Is there a potential, if we are moving towards circular economy, to look at valorisation of some of these waste streams? Can we take a step back and ask the questions, you know, is it possible to decommission? Is it possible to take these parts, strip them down and do something with them as opposed to just shredding them? Now, there's a lot of changes coming, a lot of drivers for change in this sector. First one is societal. We got things like flight shaming before COVID-19. European flights were down 4%, particularly in countries like Sweden, because of the people saying, why are you flying? You should take a train instead. And we've got this awareness now of being becoming a net zero country. I mean, Scotland's leading the way, but every other major economic power is also setting targets for becoming carbon neutral. So the society is aware of that and flying is no longer a badge of honour. You get questioned, why do you take that flight for? Legislation as well. We've got timing of waste management uh, procedures. What can you dispose of? And also landfill taxes. It goes up over every year. It makes it more... Well, it makes it less attractive to put things in the ground. We also find in the leasing companies and the asset management companies are funded by, amongst other things, pension funds. 
And the green credentials, which some of these pension funds are now claiming or wishing to attain to, doesn't sit well with uh, what in essence is an, it's a junkyard where you strip down the aircraft and shred it. So there's a lot of drivers pushing us to look at more environmentally friendly and sustainable ways of decommissioning. And then there's the economics. The cost of storage of an aircraft can be about 10,000 US dollars a month, just because you, got to, you can't just leave it there, you've got to maintain it, check, even simple things like turn the wheels every month. That's one of the things you have to do. So there's a cost involved in that. Also, all this material, so the example is, as a TV program about the, one of the facilities where they strip aircraft down, the parts, the metal is shredded, sent to Ipswich, sent to China, melted, and sent back to the UK. So with this push to do more reassuring is an opportunity here for us to look at this an ideal you know, example of how we can do more inside the country than outside. And there's also things such as carbon credits, which could also be used as an economic incentive. So the, one of the challenges is greater material recovery. Uh, and currently, the way we do it is we shred the aircraft frames. This is what you usually see pictures of. Cheap to do, environmental impact is quite high. Going forward, the ideal thing would be to disassemble it bit by bit, so to identify where the materials are and cut according to different materials. That would be a great opportunity. And in between, there's a various combination of techniques. Now, to achieve this, we need to look at things like technology, getting companies involved to look at smarter ways of slicing up planes or separating materials. We're also going to need a skilled workforce, which is part of the activity I carried out for the Scottish Government, was to identify where the gap is and how do we um, address it. And the last one, which is pertinent to today, is the building up of supply chains. Can we build up a local supply chain to take some of these parts and do something with them, rather than the shredding option. And part of my report for the Scottish Government was looking at revenue streams. The current business model is you take the parts, you get paid to take them off the aircraft, you're a decommissioner, and what you're left with is material you recycle. Going forward, opportunities such as repurposing, doing something smart with some of the parts, like the pictures down the right hand side, varying from a, a lamp to actually an office cubicle, which may seem a bit strange given where we are now, with COVID, but there is interest. Can I take parts of the air, aircraft fuselage and create safe working parts to put in places like shopping malls? So therefore, you know, it's a novelty to have it there, but it also becomes a COVID, I wouldn't say COVID free, but it's a safe environment to keep uh, the occupants away from any contamination. So there's interests like that coming out from various sources. And some of the other opportunities I mentioned there, are uh, office furniture is also a very popular one. A lot of companies like the idea of a conversation piece, but we've got to be more creative than that. So one of the activities I'm involved in is with a design company is to get them to look at certain mundane parts of aircraft to see how they can possibly come up new uh, applications for it. So we've got upcycling and repurposing as two of the interesting uh, directions we can take to look at how to someone take some of these parts back into the circular economy. At the same time, the technology, it's a very old technique to have to strip aircraft. It takes between six and eight weeks to take one aircraft, one wide-bodied aircraft apart. There's a lot of potential for industry and academia to get involved looking at how to reduce the cycle time. We've done it for manufacturing. Why can't we do it for disassembly and decommissioning? Can we look at, can we map the aircraft out to know exactly which materials where to make it smarter so we get homogeneous material coming out which have a higher value so material recovery would be great as well and i know crispin mentioned ai i'm gonna have to mention blockchain having more information about the parts gives more visibility to the supply chain it could also um, have economic impact that you know what's coming off when and you can schedule it into things like maintenance so there's a lot of interest in blockchain particularly from the fintech sector to get involved in the decommissioning area. So how to get involved, some mechanisms for engagement. Now on this call, we have quite a few people from the Aerospace Digital Visualization Suite. This is led by South Ayrshire Council, and it's under something called the Advancing Manufacturing Challenge Fund. And this is a, a fund administrated by Scottish Enterprise, but from the European Union. Partners in that particular project, along with South Ayrshire, are Enmis and Strathclyde. And another project which Renoir is going to be talking about in a bit more detail is the supply chain aerospace 
uh, project. Yet again, South Asia and MS. My particular project, which I'll expand on in the next few slides, is also on supply chain, but focusing primarily on looking at the remanufacturing and reuse of parts. So the ADV suite, um, all these projects are funded also by the European Regional Development Fund. It's aimed at SMEs to get them into the supply chain. It's primarily for the Scottish aerospace sector. That's where the funding comes through. And it's also at the same time allowing connectivity to National Manufacturing Institute Scotland and also the Advanced Forming Research Centre. So we can provide the technical support to help companies which want to get into the industry and to get over those barriers. Now, the good thing about the visualization suite, which I'm not showing here because it always blows my computer, is the facilities they have in terms of virtual reality and augmented reality. So they actually go out to companies, they either scan companies to show what is the current layout and what could be better. They also do activities around developing solutions. So it could be a training solution or one example is using augmented reality to make it easier to move aircraft around a crowded environment. So I guess later on during the Q&A, my teammates on that who are here, which will be uh, Brian Ronald and Ross Graham, who are both on the call, are available to talk about that. On the left hand side, you'll see the website for that project in case you want to engage them uh, to discuss more. The other project I'm going to finish off on is the supply chain development for lifetime extension and re reuse. We need to think of something more sexy than that as a title, but nonetheless, this project started in January. It will last until uh, February 2023, and it's focusing on three sectors, aircraft decommissioning, end of life extension for wind turbines, and end of life extension for rolling stock. Three very distinct areas, but a lot of overlap. They're all are complex equipment. They all have challenges about confidence, about extending life of parts. And what we're trying to do is bring SMEs into the supply chain, which doesn't really exist that like well in Scotland, but at the same time, because of the climate emergency, ensure they adopt best practices in terms of carbon footprints, and also where possible through the MS partnership, bring in technology to help them deliver new products, as well as monitor their energy efficiency. Quite a few partners involved in this, Strathclyde, Emmys, and you see three councils are there, uh, East Ayrshire, South Ayrshire, and South Lanarkshire. We also have the Scottish Institute for Remanufacture and also Smart Sustainable East Kilbride. How we're we approaching it is we are capturing the sector needs, which we've been doing over the last three months, understanding, talking to the big players, understanding where the gaps are, trying to see how we can improve on that, um, You know where, where the gaps are, how we can actually map that into what as an ask from the companies to industry. And then we identify SMEs and help prepare SMEs by applying. We have a team of eight people to go out there. For SMEs, it's all free of charge, which is quite a quite a good thing to hear. And we're actually there to order the company, identify opportunities, and also take them on the journey. At the same time, we're preparing their workforce by training them and uh, through things like continuing professional development courses and also in terms of standards. And through MMIS, we have the ability to do demonstrators to test out technology before the company invests. And you can see below, we have the various teams under the project. So we have the project management and the future SME, which is these tools. We have NMIS and Scottish Institute for Manufacture on the technology support side. And we are embedding three supply chain engagement specialists into the district, so into the three councils to work with the companies so they're not be drawn into academia, they'll be out there each day engaging companies. That's my last slide, I think exactly 20, 20 minutes. Uh, contact details there in case you're interested in getting hold of me for anything else. Perfect, thank you very much, David. So I've had some questions here, so I'm gonna run through them for you. So the first one is asking, as well as aircraft decommissioning, would it be useful to explore the opportunity on retrofitting current stranded aircraft to hydrogen slash SAF use. I say this, uh, yeah, well, that's the, the main body of the question. It's possible. Um, I, th I think the challenge around at the moment is uh, SAF is easier, but for hydrogen, we're still looking at small aircraft. It is possible to take them out, or take one of those out of service and look at that, but you've got to choose the right model. So yes, it's um, as test beds. Yes, we're not there yet to scale it up, 
but we've got so many aircraft of different sizes and um, capacities coming out. It could be an option, yes. And I know there's a lot of interest around hydrogen for flight as well at the moment. There's been a few announcements over the last couple of days. So yeah, it's a yes. Okay, interesting. Um, the next one I have is two questions, but Daniele, I count five question marks here, so I'll, I'll try my best with this one. Uh, so it says, regarding the waste in engine and electronics, would it be possible to remanufacture and reuse, i.e. recalibrate, uh, the huge amount of sensors and gauges in the airplane, possibly also to other usage? The answer is yes and no at the same time. What's happening quite interesting is that a lot of the avionics are bought back by the manufacturers to take them out of the market. So imagine, say, a new, I'm just putting figures out of the air, but say a I can say a landing gear, for example, because that's what I know. The price of a second-hand landing gear, which is as good as a new one, can be one-third the price, or even less if it's been quali if it's qualified by one-third the price. The same for avionics. A lot of it gets pulled back because if I'm selling a new avionics system for one million, and if I can buy a second-hand one for 200,000, if I take out the market, which is what the OEMs do, I secure my one million pound uh, business. So we find a lot of it is like that, but yes, I'm thinking about some of the pumps as well for fuel pumps. Could we repurpose those? So sensors, yes, if we get the right ones. Um, typically when aircraft is decommissioned, up to 900 parts are taken out to be going to go back into the supply chain and aftermarket. A lot of those are the kind of things such as sensors, but it's, it depends on which model. So yes, there is opportunities, Daniela, to do that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's a nice business model, virtually, if you get it right. Yeah, and um, I suppose the second part of his question is asking, uh, is it possible given the current methods, um, disassembly, environment and equipment? Sorry, I missed that one. Given, uh, given the current uh, methods available, such as disassembly, environment and equipment, and then does it need to be a change in airplane design to make this possible? Uh, for other reuse activities, uh, such as design for circular economy? Absolutely, it's happening. So I had meetings with Boeing and Airbus to discuss decommissioning, and they were very interested to find out the whole process of decommissioning so it can link back to how they're going to make the next generation plane. So we have the whole idea that the future planes will be more modular and parts can be replaced and reused on other planes. So it's definitely going to be feeding into the next generation of aircraft. And I think the aircraft manufacturers have realized it's a missed opportunity. If they can take the parts back themselves and reuse them, they also get higher value. So we are seeing that mentioned, not just designed for disassembly, but designed for reuse and designed for, I guess, next generation, you know, recycling it in the sense it ends up in the next aircraft. Is the technology there at the moment? Um, some of the stuff isn't there. I mean, it depends how, how much you want to strip an aircraft down. If you want to de-rivet an aircraft, it takes 20 to 30 seconds to take a rivet out of an aluminium rivet, and there's a couple of hundred thousand to take out. So it's not economical. Should you use automation? You could do, but what are you doing? You get a piece of metal which doesn't have a very high resale value. So a lot of technology is there. Whether it's economic to use it at the moment, probably not. We need to see a change in government regulations, which we suspect is coming to actually encourage this kind of activities. But at the moment, I don't think a lot of it's economical to do. Brilliant, thank you very much. And I have one question for you. Um, is there a, a bit of a gold rush going on just now with aircraft decommissioning? And if so, how would you get involved with um, some finding some of these contracts? There's a, there's a gold rush. There's a lot of panic from the aircraft leasing companies. They don't want to spend $10,000 a month. When I spoke to one, well, with one of my colleagues I spoke to one of the companies which provides the aircraft, they said, when can we give you the seven aircraft you want? And I never asked for any aircraft. So they're quite keen to get them decommissioned. There is a gold rush. In this country, we are the third biggest in the world at decommissioning aircraft. We, we decommission maybe 120 a year out of that 450. Um, but I think there is a panic to get these aircraft out and the only way to do it is to increase capacity. So there's opportunity for new decommissioners to come into the business. There's one big new entrant in America funded by uh, the Middle East who are looking at building a few facilities. So it's definitely, I think it's a gold rush period.
which will stabilize over time, but we will we are being forced to get rid of aircraft graveyards. And I think Biden will do the same in the US. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your presentation there. Um, we're now going to break for short comfort break uh, to allow everyone to get a cup of coffee, drink water. Um, but Crispin is also going to um, provide us the link to the survey in the, the chat bar. And we'd be really grateful if you could, there we go, perfect, right on cue. Um, if you could have a go at filling that out during the break and we will uh, meet back here for five past three. Thank you.
So we'll just restart in a few moments time at five past, but um, if anybody has any question, further questions for the presenters that have uh, presented thus far, uh, please feel free to put them into the chat box and we'll try and pick up on them um, in the session if we have time or alternatively the um, presenters can reach out to you uh, after the event. If you could put that back into presentation mode, Andreas, that'd be brilliant. Um, we're just about to make a start on the next section of the webinar today, um, where we're going to be talking about the remake testbed and hybrid AM at uh, NMIS, um, as well just quickly about the AM BATS project that we are working on. So we'll, we'll get started with that just in one moment's time. I hope everybody's managed to get themselves a nice warm drink because it's certainly not the, the sunny weather that we had last week, unfortunately. OK, I think we'll we'll make a start just now. So Andreas, if I could have the, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to a project that I'm leading and it's called Additive Manufacturing Business and Technology Support, AMBATS for short. Um, it is part of the same funding that uh, David Butler spoke about er earlier on, the Advancing Manufacturing Challenge Fund. Um, so it's moderated by the Scottish Enterprise, uh, but the funding body is the European Union. 
So the lead research institution on this is in this part of the University of Strathclyde. And we have Stephen Fitzpatrick, who is the principal investigator on it. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm the project lead on this one. And it's been running since April 2020 last year and will be running until December 2022. So what we are offering SMEs is a variety of support packages um, around the adoption of um, additive manufacturing technologies. Now, this ranges from um, actual manufacturing with additive technologies, as well as some of the supporting um, things around that, such as softwares. Um, so we'll be discussing about uh, funding opportunities later in the workshop. So if this is something that's of interest to you, please reach out to us and we'll, we'll get in touch with you. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Andreas? Yeah, so as I mentioned, there are a variety of different support packages. These are just some examples of how they may look for you. But what we'll do is based on what it is that you want to achieve, we will tailor these for you. And this is everything from just trying to understand if what you manufacture is potentially suitable for additive manufacturing, all the way through to things like process validation and um, optimization of the manufacturing process itself. We can also help you with things like business case development. If you're applying for funding and um, trying to make a case internally within your business, if additive is a potential option for you to take forward. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, Dr. Andreas Reimer is going to present some of the work that we are doing at ENMIS in a wider strategic sense, but also talking about some of the technologies that we have in house and that if you work with us on this project or in, indeed in any other project um, you could have access to. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr Andreas Reimer to give his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much Grand and I just thank you very much uh, the presenters before. So our um, recap a little bit on the secure economy, which obviously David and uh, Crispin already touched based on. So with the remanufacturing or remake testbed, as we call it in NMIS, uh, we want to go really from a linear economy to the circular economy, um, which really has a lot of um, you know, obviously um, challenges ahead. So like and obviously the environmental um, challenge that we want to tackle and at the costs. So and remanufacturing can help us to really reduce both. Um, and especially the um, the the uh, in terms of greenhouse gases, so which we want to reduce. So there were studies which suggesting actually that greenhouse gases um, produced in manufacturing uh, up to 45% of all the greenhouse gases. So obviously remanufacturing and the circular economy um, are helping to make a significant impact here. And that's basically what we are looking from NMIS um, about five years ago. Now we, we started this journey as well to use technology to reduce actually the carbon emission um, significantly. So this gives you an overview of the um, activities we actually have around the test bit within NMIS. Um, as I said, so we, we are more the on, on the technology focus just for just now. Um, we are looking, for example, in this case here, more on the uh, component value stream um, to really push through um, the remanufacture or remake um, process. So in, in the beginning, obviously, when a, when a component, let's say, comes a used component comes in. So um, first of all, we need to actually identify and inspect the component, what state it is in. We need to do some cleaning development, which we also currently started. So we, we have in-house NDE and scanning technologies which allow us to actually achieve or um, exactly determine what is the geometry. So using then this kind of information, we push it then through, um, um, currently we use a lot of additive manufacturing technologies. 
Um, we have in-house at so laser metal deposition. So um, on, a, on a hybrid system, I will come to this one a little bit later in a bit more detail. We have then also warm wire arc additive manufacturing. It's basically a welding process which allows us also to build maybe a little bit bigger component um, or remanufacture a bit bigger components. We recently got um, um, tendered a cold spray system, which we will get online at so hopefully end of this year, um, which allows us especially to remanufacture um, worn surfaces and um, also um, small geometries. And we also have a lot of um, activities going around friction steer additive manufacturing, it's called, um, or MELD, which is um, um, a semi solidus um, technology uh, with very good uh, material properties. So, um, so once we basically rebuild the component or features, uh, on the components, so obviously we need to do some conditioning of the material because a lot of the technologies actually require additional um, conditioning like heat treatment. So specialized heat treatment needs to be applied to the component and then we need to do some uh, machining. Um, so and we also recently got uh, another portable machining um, uh, machine which allows us even to uh, move this machine into or onto the to the component in maybe in the in one of those kind of cells like warm cell or in the cold spray cell to machine the component directly with one setup so which obviously reduces the setup time and so on um, after the component has been basically fully um, uh, yeah, re remade. So obviously we need to um, see if if it actually has maybe some porosity in there or if there is any kind of defects within the component. So we we're working with uh, our colleagues in StressCloud the Q um, on um, automated NDE ultrasonic um, um, uh, detection. And then obviously we have also in-house a CMM machine, which allows us really to see if if the component is precise to the uh, required dimensions um, as the component was before. And last but not least is obviously the testing of the component. So we, we want to see, okay, what are the stresses inside the component? Are they actually in, in, in service? Are they performing the same? Um, we have ultrasonic measurements and so on. So we really look then into the material sites after they have been um, remanufactured if they are up to the standard which we require. So those is obviously all kind of quite um, manufacturing um, or hardware based, but we're also looking more or also on, on more and more on, on the uh, more software skill side. So we do life cycle um, analysis. So obviously David's group and so on. They, they, they um, and especially, sir, they're looking especially in those kind of life cycle assessments um, to really see where we can actually pick up the um, component in in the circular um, economy approach. We're looking also into the uh, calculation of carbon capturing, so and calculation how much carbon we actually do save in the process. Um, because obviously all those kind of nice technologies are sounding fancy, but do we actually save and how much do we save? So those kind of questions we are currently answering. Um, one very, very um, important part of all the stuff I just told you is, is actually the certification validation. So it's uh, quite important to get actually how, how we can ensure actually that the component is to the um, to the non standard. Um, another uh, important factor is simulations. So we need to obviously, before we actually do those experiments, they, they're not always the cheapest. So we obviously want to understand the process um, before actually we, we put things in the machine and doing some simulations to actually optimize the process even before we started putting things in the machine. We also creating currently and um, uh, remake remanufacturing courses with the NTTF um, program. And we had so started uh, starting to um, look into how 
we can actually change design. What that's basically what David also mentioned before, how we can actually change design um, to remanufacture it more easily. So, for example, instead of maybe gluing things together, we can use screws or whatsoever to actually get parts together to disassemble them then later easier or make it more modular. So that's also something we are starting to look at. So obviously all those um, things, um, we working with a lot of companies, SMEs, um, OEMs and so on together, but we are also working together with a lot of funders. So um, we obviously working a lot with and very closely with uh, MSER, the Scottish Institute for Remanufacturing together, um, KTN, Zero Waste Scotland, um, ATI. So it's, it's a very big funder and obviously Innovative K. So we have strong links in all those um, kind of organizations and funders to actually allow us to develop a CND proposals together with companies of any size. So I would like to um, quickly touch on two projects. Um, this one, uh, we call it Hybrid DD, just just started, literally, it's really hot off the press. So it's funded by the ATI, um, Aerospace Technology Institute. Um, it's about 15 months duration, um, 550K um, overall budget, where um, we really look into how we can use near net shape technologies like forging, forming and so on. Um, and then actually use uh, DED, in this case it's WAM, to actually produce some kind of features or remanufacture those features which um, were maybe worn or um, shed off on those components and um, yet make them just kind of manufacturing easier using less um, material resources and probably cheaper. So you can see, so we have a large variety of um, um, partners on, on this project as well. So the other one is um, digital. So this one was a project um, funded by Innovate UK. So this is maybe less um, aerospace, um, um, you know, application. However, the, this kind of the idea and uh, the um, yeah, so it can can taken into obviously also aerospace applications, but it's it's really to show what we can actually achieve using AM um, to remanufacture any kind of components. Yeah. So this one, uh, as I said, in the, um, Innovate UK fund a project. Um, so this this is the die, so they, they form bucketies with it, and it's uh, it's it's a high. Uh, it's a H13 die, so it's a very hard tool steel um, to really um, resist high shock loads, pressure, thermal loads, and so on. Um, because obviously those, those are the environments usually forging uh, is operating. So obviously those dies are very much, um, um, you know, exposed to wear and um, yeah. So this. This project, just to give a little bit of background, so we used laser metal deposition. Laser metal deposition is a technology, it's basically blown powder with the laser in, in the middle. So, and the when the blown powder is coming to, to the focal point of the laser, so it melts and then you basically deposit a, a layer of, of material. Um, so, and we have this hybrid machine, which allows us to, to use laser metal deposition and machining in one single machine, which is not not usual. So usually you have an AM machine and, and a machining machine, and then you have several setups, but this machine allows us to do everything in one machine. Um, so this project really went through, okay, so as I mentioned before, this this kind of component value chain. So we measured the, um, the one component and then it was cloud processed and we developed adaptive cam cycles and then the uh, um, additive process, machine process and so on. So um, going on here, it was a little bit lack of time. Um, so basically this, this tool was, as I said before, manufactured from H13. It's a hard uh, uh, wearing alloy. 
And usually this company forged 1,300 components on average with this kind of die. And then after 1,300 components, it basically looked like this completely worn. Um, we did then obviously this metrology, we, we identified um, the worn areas, cleaned the component a little bit. And just for visualization, you can see here basically the worn areas. We then developed a CAM cycle and additive manufacturing cycles to remanufacture the um, those one um, areas using Stellite 21. So and laser metal deposition, and you can see here on the right hand side, that's basically the LMD in action. So it deposits really one layer, one small line of um, um, additive. Um, yeah. So. After the, it's basically finished, so the the component looked like like this. So we obviously have a build up, so it's a higher than the original surface um, of of additive material. So which we then need to kind of machine down again to the final geometry. So and as part of this, here you can see actually in this in this one. So you have this machine, so where it's doing the um, laser metal deposition and then. It's, it's coming down the, the tool to to machine it. So this this company put it basically back into their service, and they uh, achieved another 1,400 components, which actually um, equates to about 100, almost 110 percent extended die life. So in, instead of 1,300, we got in the end 2,700 components out of one single die just to remanufacture. The obviously the the uh, carbon emission saving on this one is is really huge. If you um, consider that you you don't have to manufacture a new die which is quite big and chunky and actually has a lot of captured carbon in there. So what we really learned from this is that. When we uh, use um, remanufacturing on um, any kind of components, it can significantly reduce the carbon uh, emission and also reduce the waste stream. Um, we also have obviously a much lower lead time. Um, you know, so, so usually manufacturing those kind of components taking a lot of time. Um, so. Uh, to, to manufacture, so you reduce the lead time here significantly. And you also um, probably won't need as many um, spares, so you have less warehouse um, costs. And yeah, so and it also obviously showed that it can um, withstand extreme environments uh, for even for a longer period of time. So that's basically me. Um, any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much, Andreas. It, it's, it's really interesting to see that these um, additive technologies can be applied not only to kind of remanufacture parts and components, but also mm. the, the tooling that would have originally perhaps manufactured some of these um, parts and components. Um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting that you can kind of capture that full value stream on there. Um, yep. So I've had two questions sent across to me. Uh, mm -hmm. bear with me one second. Um, and first one was, what are some of the challenges of manufacturing certified components with um, additive manufacturing? So what, what are the... Sorry, what are some of the challenges of manufacturing component... Uh, sorry, manufacturing uh, certified components using additive manufacturing? So obviously... The, there are a lot of ch challenges in terms of, you know, how we can actually, how do we know what is actually coming out? Because obviously additive manufacturing is a very, in, in brackets, new process. Um, if you compare it to, let's say, forging, machining, there are hundreds of years there. So we have a lot of experience of how we can actually achieve um, material outputs. However, additive is fairly new and we obviously need to ensure that that the process are consistent and there are a lot of variables in in the in the AM process and um, especially on if you if you consider this one on on remanufacturing 
So it obviously throws then an, an additional spanner in the works so that you don't know what what kind of condition the original component was. So how, you know, so th this kind of play. So you, you, th there are a lot of technical challenges which needs to be answered and to get really a consistent basis. And there actually, um, we are taking part of a, a lot of uh, joint industry projects with insurers likes of DNVGL and uh, it's obviously not aerospace related, but um, and Lloyd's um, to really tackle those kind of questions, how we can actually make sure that, that we get a consistent output. Yeah, so I think maybe just to expand on that, um, there's a lot of work ongoing just now to develop all the, the standards. Um, because as Andreas said, kind of uh, in, in quotes, it is a relatively new process. Mm. Uh, so the the guidelines and standards are all being developed um, at the moment. And there are some technologies that are more advanced than others in that sense. So I'd probably say something like metal powder bed manufacturing, mm. which is one of the most widespread, is um, had most of the industry focus to begin with. And there's lots of standards uh, appearing for that and have already been published. Um, but we also saw, saw earlier this week that uh, Polymer, there's a new set of standards that have been um, uh, set out and agreed upon for that. Um, but I suppose a lot of the work that we're doing cross sector with non-critical components is helping boost that and boost our understanding um, the, the likes of the, the digital project that Andreas mm. showed there. It's a, a non-critical component because it's tooling and yep. uh, at the end of the day, if the, the tooling fails, the tooling fails. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a critical component, but every, everything we, we learn from that comes back full cycle. And this is where we're really starting to see um, the kind of advantage um, of uh, digital twinning. So yep. as Andreas uh, hinted at, that we don't necessarily know too much about parts as they're coming in just now. But as we adopt this digital uh, twinning uh, process of understanding and logging all the, the data and cycles of components, when we do bring them in for remanufacturing, we understand a bit more about what they've been through. And that will help inform the decisions we make in terms of materials. So such as Andreas mentioned that the, the original die was manufactured out of H13, but we chose to use a, a hard wearing um, material, uh, a, a cobalt alloy, Stellite 21, to improve the, the wear resistance for that tool because its failure mechanism yep. was wear. Um, and this is really where we're starting to see this get more and more intelligent and advanced. I think obviously, as, as you mentioned, the, the non-critical is, is really critical, you know, so because obviously a lot of yeah processes are for, for non-critical applications. So as soon as you get in a critical application, especially in aerospace, so you don't want to be the person who put the component out there. So, you know, if, if a plane and if an airplane in the worst case comes down, you know, so, um, so those, those things obviously needs to be investigated and um, so and there's still a bit road ahead of us but um, I'm very confident that that we, we are getting there. Yeah. yeah and I suppose this is one of the big advantages of the, the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland in that we we are embedded and as part of the University of Strathclyde so a lot of that fundamental research that's happening at a university academia level, we are bringing through the kind of TRL stages into mm. the higher TRL skills for industry to really kind of capitalize on and uh, use in um, the use in industry. Mm. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much, thank Andreas. You. It was a thank great you. presentation. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, Benoit Fernandez who's going to be presenting on the Aerospace Supply Chain Project. Thank you, Grant. So before talking, <clears throat> sorry, before talking about the Aerospace uh, program, I will just introduce um, NMIS Supply Chain Activities. So NMIS is working with supply chains from various sectors, and we are doing that through projects that we are carrying on within the different technology teams within NMIS. However, 
Um, a need for a broader supply chain support has been identified. So Enmis created the industrial transformation team. I will now give you a quick overview of the team's objective and the support activities that, that we are providing. So the overall aim for, of the team is to develop a resilient and sustainable UK manufacturing supply base by supporting companies of all sizes and all sectors. So the underlying objectives being to allow companies to react quicker to opportunities and changes in market demand, to support UK supply base to be more robust, resilient and innovative, to contribute on digital upskilling of the workforce, to provide companies access to technology and innovation, and to explore emerging opportunities and reshore manufacturing capabilities within Scotland and within the UK. So to realize these objectives, uh, the team has created a, an approach based around four activities. The first activity is being capability assessment, then operational support, supply chain support, and finally anchoring innovation. So our capability assessment activities are using advanced analytics to assess both industrial capabilities and market needs. We also use a portfolio approach to evaluate production and services. Our operational support activities are based on industrial operation management, manufacturing process optimization, operational excellence, and development of route to manufacturing. Our supply chain support support activities, sorry, are based on supply chain management and development of manufacturing and technological opportunities based on current and future strengths. And finally, our anchoring innovation activities assess companies' dynamics capabilities, dynamics capabilities being their ability to adapt to new markets or requirements needs. And we are linking, linking sorry, with uh, NMIS technology teams, so all the teams uh, across NMIS, to ensure that uh, those companies have access to our latest technologies. So to, to give uh, a proper example of, um, of the support we, we are running, uh, I will now introduce, uh, as Grant said, one, one of the projects we are, we are working on. So let me just switch the slide. Bear with me. Okay, so the project in question and that I was referring is the aerospace and space supply chain project. So this project is uh, led, as David Butler said before, by South Ayrshire Council, with Enmis being part of um, sorry, with Enmis being part of the project teams, and. At his name specified it, we are focusing on this specific project on space and aerospace opportunities for the Scottish supply base. So, as said before, the project is funded by the European, European Regional Development Fund, but it's also matched uh, by the Council and NMIS funding. The project objectives are to help SMEs enter the aerospace and space sectors, to match uh, businesses with specific opportunities appropriate to your organization's capabilities, to also help OEMs primes to develop a more sustainable and local supply chain, and to provide access to NMIS to support innovation and cost competitive solution. Also shown uh, on the bottom of the page, uh, are the other organizations that are available to provide support uh, for, for the project. So our intent is to encourage um, a collaborative approach between tier ones, SMEs and the other support organizations through our project. So we have, if I can say it like, like that, uh, kind of a middleman role in, in this space. So we know from working with SMEs and uh, tier ones that there is enthusiasm on both sides to increase local sourcing. 
We know that Scotland has world-class innovation and advanced manufacturing skills and resources. And we think that this project brings together all of its enthusiasm and knowledge to create tangible opportunities for both SMEs and OEMs. So the team in Southshire Council works with Chair ones and OEM to identify these opportunities. We are gathering insight to current and future supply chain requirements. We are identifying entry points for local SMEs, and we are looking for opportunities for current local incumbent suppliers to increase their share and to identify uh, innovation strength. Uh, we are providing a range of supports. So we are doing capability reviews, procurement and supply chain reviews, gap analysis to improve performance. Uh, we provide insight into the aerospace and space market to help the company to engage with it. Uh, we are using our network to marketing to market to marketing Scottish companies' capabilities to the tier one businesses. And our main role is to match SMEs to OEMs opportunities. We are also helping companies, helping SMEs in their uh, accreditations uh, journey. Uh, as, as we were telling before, we are introducing to um, manufacturing solutions via all the technologies that we have within NMIS. Uh, introduction of digital technologies, so it's a ADVS uh, project that David was uh, talking about earlier. We are also introducing uh, business to improvement services, and we are introducing business to potential funders to get more funding to, to, to access the market. We uh, are also acting as a conduit to SMAS and SC21 and the wider network and uh, provide support to SMEs, assisting them to overcome barrier to entry. Uh, this slide shows how the project links uh, with support organization across, uh, across Scotland. So we are in uh, weekly, almost weekly links with, com with organization like SMAS, Scottish Enterprise, SEED and, and all the others who are uh, listed here. So by working with us, you, you have one focal point to all those organizations as we will help you to understand the quite busy landscape when, when company require help. Uh, the project team uh, has around 80 years of combined experience within the industry. And using that experience, we can assist you gaining entry into aerospace and space market. This uh, will include, include sorry, reviewing manufacturing capabilities, the potential for new innovation, as well as improving procurement and supply chain management activities. We will also use our experiences to, to look at ways of improving productivity within your own organization. Uh, on this slide, I, I just put the, the contact of, of the different members of the team. So Daniel Wood and, and Gary Williamson, which are the two main leaders uh, on South Ayrshire Council. And then myself and Daniel Marini from, from NMIS. Um, I think we will move to, to the mural and the networking session, but maybe just before that, if there is uh, questions, I will let uh, Grant Oh, sorry. Excellent. Thank you very much, Benoit. That was my screen have frozen. But yeah, back to it. No problem at all. Um, so I have a, a question from your colleague, in fact, uh, from mm -hmm. Daniele, and he's asking: Is this approach uh, potentially extendable to other sectors? Yeah. So, so I did present two two different things here. So I present the approach that we are developing within Enmis, which which can be applied to any sectors. We are applying the approach or the, the assessment uh, capabilities, tools and frameworks that we have developed for space and aerospace within um, the space and aerospace project. But obviously those framework and, and, and tools are um, able to, to be adapted to each, each sectors. And, and the feedback that we have from them, from them when we assess a company just not give them um, criteria again one sectors but gives criteria against uh, a lot of sectors and then we can help companies to define which sector is the best suited for for them 
Excellent. That sounds really interesting. Um, so I'm just conscious of time and realise that we are going to be now running the workshop. So I think we'll we'll cap it there on questions. So we've just put in the the chat function um, a link to Mural. Um, now I know some people will have used Mural, some maybe.